भद्रम कर्णे शृणुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्येक्षेजत्रा स्थिरंगगम सस्तनु व्यशेम देवहित यदा स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्धश्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्व स्वस्ति नस्ताक्ष्यो अरिष्टने स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा तो ओ शांति 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 Uh, please follow me in the chanting of the mantras. I'll chant first, and uh, please repeat after me. Om Itte Tadaksharam. Idagam Sarvam. Tasya Upavyakyanam. Bhutam Bhavat Bhavishyaditi. ओंकारात तदप्योकार ब्रह्मा अयम आत्मा ब्रह्म सोयम आत्मा चतुष्पा थर्ड मंत्र जागरित स्थानो बहिष्प्रज्ञा जागरित स्थानो बहिष्प्रज्ञा सप्तांग एकोनविंशति मुख स्थूल भोग वैश्वानर प्रथम पाद मंत्र फोर स्वप्नस्थान अंत प्रज्ञा सप्तांग एकोनशति मुख प्रविक्त भोग तेजसो द्वितीय पाद मंत्र फाइव युप्त न कंचन काम कामयते युप्त न कंचन काम कामयते न कंचन स्वप्न पश्य स्वप्न पश्य तत्सुषुप्त सुषुप्त स्थान एकीभूत प्रज्ञानगन एवानंदमयो हि आनंद भुक् चेत मुख प्राजस्तृतीय पाद सिंत्र प्रभवाप्ययो हि भूतानाम दिस उपनिषद इज एन एनक्वायरी इन टू दी Atman, the self, and the way that this Upanishad approaches the whole problem is by saying, the up, the self, that means you, have four aspects. The self has four aspects. What are the four aspects? Consciousness, consciousness, itself appears. as the waker and the waking world
consciousness itself appears as the dreamer. And the dream word. Consciousness itself appears as the deep sleeper. And the deep sleep world. It's no, not much of a world. It's everything is resolved there in deep sleep. The Sanskrit terms, consciousness is Chaitanyam. So it appears as the waker. And the waker is, is given a technical term, Vishwa. But not only that. Here, the Upanishad says, we experience everything as individual and total. So, here I am an individual and here is the totality which I am experiencing. So, individual and cosmic, microcosm and macrocosm. And the Upanishad says, consciousness itself is the microcosm and the macrocosm. The microcosm which you experience yourself as, the individual being, and the macrocosm which you experience as your universe. So, consciousness associated with the microcosm, there is a pair in each case. In the waking world, it is Vishwa and Virat. Consciousness associated with the gross universe, with the physical body, is called Vishwa. And with the entire universe, consciousness associated with that is called Virat. In deep sleep, or in, in dream, once we fall asleep, we dream. And consciousness, which is associated with the body and mind of the individual in the dream. Not the one who is sleep, sleeping in the bed and dreaming. Individual, you project yourself in the dream. That individual being is called Taijasa. And there are reasons why these names have been given. And the entire, co the subtle world all taken together. The minds of everybody all taken together is called Hiranyagarbha. And in deep sleep, the same consciousness is called Pragya, the individual. And the entire cosmos um, in its resolved state is called, consciousness associated with the cosmos in its resolved state is called Ishvara or Antaryami. This book calls it Antaryami. Let's use Ishwara. This is the term we are used to. Ishwara means God. And the first mantra we saw was dedicated to the waking stage. So this is aspect one of the Atman. The self has four aspects, we said. So this is aspect one of the self. This is aspect two of the self. The second mantra, not the second mantra, sorry. This is the, um, the third mantra. Mantra three was dedicated to this one. And the fourth mantra was dedicated to this one. And the third aspect of the self, deep sleep, uh, mantras 5 and 6 are dedicated to um, the deep sleep aspect, aspect of the self. Why are we calling it aspects of the self? This is how we experience ourselves. Throughout the day, you are one kind of experience you have when you are awake, one kind of experience you have when you are dreaming, and another kind of experience you have in deep sleep. These are the three kinds of experience we all share. We all have it. And the point that the Upanishad wants to make is not waking, dreaming or deep sleep. This is just by the way. This is as a doorway or as an uh, instrument to point out to you the fourth aspect of the self. Which is consciousness in itself. Not consciousness dressed up. In the, in the physical body of the waker, not consciousness dressed up in the subtle body of the dreamer, not consciousness uh, tucked in in the deep sleep, uh, in the blankness of deep sleep, but quite apart from the, the causal universe of deep sleep, the subtle universe of, of dreaming and the gross or physical universe of waking, none of which are anything different from consciousness. They are all dresses projected by consciousness which consciousness puts on and acts out these experiences. But apart from all of that, in itself, what is the self? According to the Upanishad, it is just pure consciousness. Now already, a number of people have told me, that just a minute, 
more I think about it, why are they saying this is the fourth aspect of the self? Isn't this the self itself? And these three maybe projections, uh, aspects of the self, this is the reality, right? Correct, you have got it right. Uh, when you say that, when you begin to sense that, it's not four aspects of the self actually. The Atman, the self, the reality about the self is this pure consciousness. And these three are the roles that pure consciousness plays. Then why are you calling it four aspects of the self? Because these three are known to us. Right now, this is unknown to us. That we are pure consciousness, not a body, not a mind. We are not the waker, dreamer, deep sleeper. We are the pure consciousness experiencing all of these. This is something that's not known to us. This is something which we are beginning to hear for the first time from the Upanishad. We never think about ourselves as these. Normally, what do we think of ourselves as? Our whole uh, concept of ourselves is heavily based on the waker. And we basically think, I am Sarva Priyananda. I am this guy who is standing here in Manhattan in, in the Vedanta Society. This is who I am. And yeah, the way I experienced myself in my dream, that was just an error. I dreamt. That's not really me. And the way what, what was happened in deep sleep is nothing much happened. So who am I really? I am this person in, in the waking state. We are heavily biased towards the waking experience. And yet it should convince us that part of the time in our day, even from our waking calculations, the entire waking experience is erased from our awareness. And yet, our sense of self goes on. In dream, we, we have a sense of self. We are experiencing something. Though we may wake up and dismiss it as a dream and nothing. In deep sleep, we do claim after waking up, I was in deep sleep. You see, whom, it's very interesting that when we wake up and come to the waker and we look back upon our dreams and our deep sleep, what do I claim? I, this waker, I was the person to whom this dream belongs and the uh, deep sleep also belongs. Because, how do we speak? I had a dream. I slept peacefully. Which means we claim the dreamer and the waker and, and, and the deep sleeper. And yet the waker, they are exclusive. This waker was not there in the dreamer. If the waker had been there in the dream, he would have said, where is the waking personality? The waking body was sleeping. At that time, the, uh, we were safely in bed and tucked in and sleeping and dreaming in the brain. If the waker was in the dream, you would have said, I am actually in my bed and this is a dream. You don't say that. You actually think this experience you are having is like another waking experience. You don't even conceive of it as being a dream. Really, waking, dreaming and deep sleep equally all belong to something beyond them all. Which is right here, right now. But we are missing it. This is what the Upanishad wants to introduce us to. That's why it says, when you look at yourself, three aspects of yourself are evident. You wake, you dream, you sleep. The reality about yourself, let's call it the fourth. It's called the fourth only in relation to the three aspects with which we are familiar. But really, that is the truth. This is four aspects, in Sanskrit four padas. So these three are actually uh, not the self really. It is the, re the self in itself, the real nature of the self is this one. Uh, yes. So is, is my waking world the same as yours? The same as mine. As your waking world. Yes, we are sharing it. Clearly it is. But my dream world is not the same. True. But if I'm creating the waking world, and uh, you're creating it as well. Yes. I'm sort of creating you. You are saying your waking world and my waking world are the same because you are speaking as this person. Right? And this person, you have other wakers in your world, all of us, and we share a common world. So this is the waking world we share. And therefore, uh, we say we, are sh we have a public reality which we share. Obviously. Now, the thing is, you are not creating this world. Even this diagram will tell you what is appearing as this world. Not the waker. The waker is not creating this world. Isn't it? What's creating this world? Consciousness itself is appearing as the waker and the waker's world. So I'm speaking from my mind, I suppose, yeah. when I say this. When you, cl you clearly say, 
right now when you're speaking, what, what are you speaking as? You're speaking as this waker, right? Just as I'm speaking as this waker. From this waker's point of view, this, this projected world is not our creation. Think carefully. When you said, but my dreamer's world I create, who creates a dreamer's world? When you are the person in the dream, do you feel in the dream that I'm creating this world? Or what do you feel? Here is a world which I'm experiencing. The dreamer, you see, you can take the, it's an example, nice example. From our waker's perspective, what do we feel? I went to sleep and I am this guy, I'm sleeping, I am generating a dream. In the dream, I'm also there. I'm a, I'm a character in my own dream. Is, isn't that what happens in a dream? And there is a dream world also. Right? The character in the dream does not generate the dream world. You never feel in the dream that I am generating all this. You feel it's all real and I'm in the middle of it. Sometimes you have fears and anxieties. Sometimes you have uh, delightful dreams. All of that, you feel it's like another waking experience. And you never feel that I am generating it. And there also, there will be many other people whom you can say, aren't we sharing a common waking experience together? It will feel like there are people, you are one of them. But when you wake up from that, you will realize this person and all the other people it met, all of them were projections from the waking state. Um, from the, from in the waker's brain, when the waker w went to sleep and dreamt. But all of them ultimately, even the waking state, the dream state, deep sleep, all of them are nothing but one consciousness appearing as subject and object, microcosm and macrocosm, in each of the three states. Only thing is, in the deep sleep state, the microcosm and the macrocosm are all mushed up together into one mass of indistinguishable mass. So it seems Nothing is known per se. It's a blankness. Now, in the last mantra, in mantra 5, we were introduced to the individual, the sleeper, you, we, the individual being in deep sleep. Uh, first of all, a definition of deep sleep was given. Uh, definition of deep sleep is to distinguish it from waking and dreaming. She never defined, the Upanishad never defined waking or dreaming. Just went straight to defining deep sleep. Because we are familiar with waking and dreaming. But deep sleep is an interesting uh, thing which we not, don't give much thought to. So the Upanishad thought, let me just define what is deep sleep. And we saw where one does not have any, it literally says when one does not sense any gross, desire any gross objects. But basically, one does not sense the waking world as a waker. One does not dream any dreams as a dreamer. One is not uh, experiencing any distinct objects. So that's the deep sleep world. And it pointed out, Eki Bhuta Pragyanaghana, two terms. Everything is reduced, resolved into a, a mass of oneness and a mass of awareness or consciousness. What does it mean? Here we have distinct objects and distinct knowledge in the waking world and in the dream world. Distinct object means here is a board, here is a pen, here is a cloth. They are all distinct objects. And when we look at the board, we have a knowledge about the board. And we have a different knowledge when we look at the pen and we have a knowledge about the pen. And we have a different knowledge when we look at the cloth and we have a knowledge about the cloth. So distinct objects, board, cloth, pen. Distinct knowledge, board knowledge, cloth knowledge, pen knowledge in our heads when we look at all of this. So the knowledge that we have in the waking world as also the dream world is distinct, uh, separate, different from each other. Every, the series of knowledge e experiences we have. And the objects are also distinct, separated from each other. But in deep sleep, it's a new way of looking at deep sleep. Imagine all the, the objects of the world shrouded in darkness, then you cannot make out any distinct object. If you switch off the lights here, draw the curtains, there's no light, absolute darkness. There are hundreds of objects here, chairs, tables, people, pictures, but then there's no light. And in deep darkness, all of them will seem like a uniform mass of, indistinguishable mass of darkness. So all the objects in our deep sleep, all the objects, which objects? Objects of the waking world, objects of the dream world, all those distinct objects, 
they are not aware of the distinctions. That's the meaning of the word Eki Bhuta. They're all masked. Yeah. Is the, is the deep sleep then an experience of non-duality? Yes. It's an experience of non-duality. So and she, she pointed out a very important thing. Is deep sleep an experience of non-duality? I was not going to go there, but yes. Deep sleep is an experience of non-duality. Non-duality in the sense, the duality of the objects, the multiplicity of the objects is not evident. It's not evident because the lights have been switched off. Is the multiplicity there or not? It's there. It must be there in some form because when we wake up or when we dream, again all those things come up. When you wake up out of deep sleep, what comes up? This world with its billions of entities, all different, exactly as it was before you went to sleep. So in deep sleep, there must be all these objects must be there. It's just we are unable to distinguish between them. And all the knowledge that we have of those objects. <coughs> Each object has its corresponding knowledge. Knowledge means an experience of that object. All those distinct experiences are also mushed up together into one non-distinct mass of awareness. That's the meaning of the term pragyana ghana. Pragyana means individual awareness. Ghana means dense. Into a dense mass of non-distinct awareness. So this is how they view deep sleep. That was the experience of the, uh, the individual, us. Pra pragya means um, there are different ways in which um, it, has been inter it has been derived. Prakarshena um, agyaha that specifically or um, which is distinctly unable to cognize anything. That's one of the uh, meanings of Pragya. Another meaning is Prakashena Gyaha, which is omniscient. We'll come to that now. So one meaning of, uh, one aspect of the, of the third aspect, one, one side is the individual deep sleeper, us when we sleep. But in, as in each case, the microcosm and the macrocosm is talked about, the individual and the cosmic. In deep sleep also, the macrocosm, all of this universe, and consciousness associated with the entire physical universe, subtle universe, that consciousness is called Ishwara, God. What is just ignorance and deep sleep and blankness for us is at the cosmic level the state of God, where consciousness is associated with the, the resolved state of the waking world and the dream world. This entire physical universe, all these minds, the contents of all our minds, all together resolved into the state of Maya. This is we are talking about the cosmic state. So consciousness associated with Maya. What is Maya? Maya is the, our entire physical world, our entire subtle world, all our minds put together, all the contents of all of that. All of that massed into an indistinguishable state, a potential state, a causal state before everything emerges. That, when consciousness is associated with that, we call that consciousness Ishwara, God. Before a product is produced distinctly, its potential state is always a causal state. It's called a causal state. So mother is the cause of the baby. Seed is the cause of the huge tree. In the same way, this, which seems to be nothing, which seems to be a void, which seems to be an emptiness. That is the cause of the universe. The storehouse is Maya and the consciousness behind it is Ishwara. So consciousness plus Maya, we call it Ishwara. This is the, the causal state. Causal, causal state of what? Causal state of the dream world, causal state of the waking world. Now when we look at what we chanted, we will see the sixth mantra. Sixth month, the fifth mantra talks about the individual and the sixth mantra talks about the cosmic. At the individual state, it seems pretty dull. I am in deep sleep, experiencing a kind of blankness. That's all. That's all how, what we experience. At the cosmic level, it's God. Karanam. Causal means karana. And effect means karyam. If you look at the mantra itself, Sixth. 
when you are talking about consciousness associated with the causal state of the universe. It is called Esha Sarveshwaraha. It is the Lord of everything. Not you or I in our deep sleep. We, you can't be called the Lord of everything. Uh, because when we wake up, we wake up into our individual little worlds. But Esha Sarveshwara consciousness with the totality, associated with the totality is Sarveshwara. Yes. Last class you mentioned that the deep sleep is sort of a corridor between waking Ah, yes. I, I don't think I got that right. That uh, refers to, she said last class I mentioned the deep sleep is like a corridor between the waking and the dream. This is what it means in the fifth mantra, in the earlier mantra, you will notice there is a word Cheto Mukhaha. Cheto Mukhaha literally translates as a door of consciousness. It is translated as who is the doorway to the experience of dream and waking states. Cheto Mukha. What does that mean? What Vedanta holds is we do not get into the waker or the dreamer directly. We have to go through the sleeper. It's, it's like, after all, what is the waker? The waker is consciousness with the, with the physical universe, with our physical body. The dreamer is consciousness with only the subtle body. Of course, in the waking body, waking life, the subtle body and the gross body are both there. So imagine the gross body to be like the shirt I am wearing. And imagine the subtle body to be like the vest I'm wearing inside this shirt. Now, in order to go from one state to another, I have to take that off and put this one on. In between, I have to be without uh, either of them. So, um, it's from deep sleep. When, you, when you're waking and you're going to dre dreams, you first have to fall asleep and forget the waker. Right? And then you go into, um, uh, into dreaming. You put on the, the dreaming equipment. So you have to first somehow forget the waker. That forgetting the waker is deep sleep. From this deep sleep, you go into dreaming. From the dreaming world, you want to come back to the waking world. You must get rid of the dream world first. Mm -hmm. At one point, you must be in sleep, neither dreaming nor waking. Then come back into the waker. So... Deep sleep is called the doorway into waking and dreaming. Because you can't stay in the corridor. But, but the source is that it's interesting. The point here is it functions as a source of this one and this one. He, he wants you to look at your deep sleep in that way. As something from which everything emerges. You see, the, the world view is a little different. The paradigm is a little different here. We normally look at the waking as the reality. And the deep sleep is the forgetting of the reality. But what they want us to see is, the deep sleep is a, like a neutral state. Where everything is there, like in the mass, in a bottle, it's all suppressed. Like we call it jack in a box. Mm -hmm. And then you let it out, you have a waking world. Or you let it out, you have a dream world. You push it all back in, deep sleep world. So the deep sleep world is a potential state where everything is there. And it comes out as the waking or the dreaming. So the dreaming and the waking, they emerge from the deep sleep. Yeah. If we are to understand the state of going from dreaming to waking, hmm. um, maybe if I give the example of like nightmares, hmm. someone gets up and wakes up suddenly from yeah. nightmares, so where is the deep sleep part in that? Because it's True. Wake. Right. We think sometimes when you wake up and you have um, memories of dreams, very vividly you remember you're dreaming, now you're awake. All right? Now, she is asking, where is the deep sleep in there? It seems we went from a dreaming to waking. Or from a nightmare to waking. Remember one thing. Even if very fleeting, even if not noticeable, logically it must have been so. Because you at one point made the transition between this is real and it's a nightmare. I mean, you don't think it's a nightmare. It's a real, horrible reality. And then you snap out of it. And you say, this is not the reality, I've woken up. Oh, that was a nightmare. You have a distinct memory of what happened in the horrible dream you had. And you clearly see this. At one point, the sense of reality must have shifted from that to this. If you follow the memories carefully, at one point the shifting is like this. Uh, the, that world is still might be vivid. But you, 
at one point you begin to realize it's a dream. It's a nightmare. And this is I'm waking up, this bed I'm waking up to is the reality. This shifting cannot happen without a, even a flash of dream, deep sleep in between. Where one is let go of and you catch the other one. Because from the deep sleep perspective, Manduke perspective, both are dreams. At one point you gave reality to this one and said that is a dream. So when you say this is real, what have you have done is you have put away your dream clothes and you have put on your waking clothes. In between, you must have been without either. That's the deep sleep state. So logically there must have been a state of switch between the two. Right, we feel that, we feel that. But it's more like a philosophical necessity that if this is a causal state, you must have gotten rid of one and put on the other one. Uh, gotten rid of that one, then put on the other one. So you must have gone through this, even fraction, uh, even in a, in a flash of, um, uh, yeah. Well, isn't this supported by scientific experiments of REM sleep, which is dream? Yes. And then dreamless state. Yes, uh, normally the doctors talk about dream sleep as... REM, REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. It seems the eyeballs move rapidly when you're dreaming. And non-REM sleep. So even modern physiology says there are two kinds of sleep. The distinction between dream and deep sleep is admitted by modern physiology. Not only by our own internal experience. But they wouldn't say that you go through uh, non-REM, uh, from REM to waking, you have to go through non-REM. Do they say that? I'm not very sure. Yeah. Yes. Right. Now, the cause of what? What is the effect? According to the Mandukya Upanishad, according to Vedanta, the effect is the waking world, this waking world, the effect is the dream world, and the cause is the deep sleep. The understanding of cause and effect is like this. The same material appears as the cause and appears as the effect. The same material. It appears as the clay and as the pot. When the for names and forms are distinct, you call it an effect. When the names and forms are not distinct, just the lump of the original material is there, you, we are calling it a cause. So, uh, the understanding of cause in Indian philosophy is, in one of the schools of Indian philosophy, uh, the, the, it's called Parinama Vada. That means the cause is transformed into the effect. Before the distinct features of the effect are visible, you're calling it a cause. When the distinct features of the effect are visible, you're calling it an effect. When it is a lump of clay, we say it's a cause. When it is a uh, pot clearly made, we say it is an effect. So the clay is the material cause and the pot is the effect. Now you're asking for the cause of the cause. Are you asking in this, in this context, the cause of the cause? I am, although I was thinking as a fourth state. That you right. So, the third state is the cause. It's a good question. The third state is, is a cause. And the first and the second states are the effects. So, this one is causing these two. These two are emerging from this. The causal world, this is the subtle, this is causal, subtle, gross or physical. This is emerging from these. Now, he's asking about the cause of the cause. What is the cause of this? Is the pure consciousness the cause of that? They say no. Pure consciousness and the causal world are not causally connected. That is what allows Advaita Vedanta to say that this alone is real. These are appearances. When you say the rope was mistaken to be a snake, can you really say that the rope is the cause of the snake. Can you really see the rope is the cause of the snake? And if you ask the rope, why did you become a snake? The rope will say, I didn't become a snake, it's your problem. The rope is not really a cause of the snake. Why not? Because the snake is not real. They belong to two different levels of reality. The, the rope is our transactional reality, Vavaharika. And the snake is an error, an illusion. So, the rope did not really cause a snake. It was a mistake. It happened because of what? Error. 
Error. And where error happened because of what? Ignorance. What ignorance? Rope ignorance. Ignorance about the rope. Similarly, here, what they are trying to say is, although all these are experienced, the causal state is experienced, the subtle state is experienced, the gross state is experienced, deep sleep is experienced, dreaming is experienced, and waking is experienced. All of them, they are not real. What is real is this consciousness alone. And this consciousness alone is experienced in these ways. Um, we consider them real by mistake. I'm putting it very, very precisely. After enlightenment, what will happen is, not that these will not be experienced. No, it's not like a rope and snake where you say, oh, I've known the rope. Now I, I will not wake, I will not dream, I will not sleep. Do enlightened people see this waking world? Yes, they do. Do they see dreams? Yes, maybe they do. Do they have deep sleep? Maybe they, they have. They have deep sleep. So in that case, these experiences continue. But the difference is this. For us, we have these experiences and this is real. You say, no, I don't think a dream is real. You don't think a dream is real compared to your waking state. But you don't deny that you saw dreams. You really saw dreams. And during a dream, you thought it was pretty real. We think these are reality. This is the reality. The enlightened person thinks this is the reality and these are the appearances of that reality. I'll repeat again. Before enlightenment, this is our whole reality. And we have no conception of this. The fourth, so-called fourth state. For us, it is the so-called fourth state which Upanishads talk about. The Upanishads talk about the fourth state and this is the so-called fourth state. But for the enlightened person, this is the reality. It's not a fourth state, fourth aspect of the Atman. It is the self. It is the reality which it projects itself. And from this point of view, the enlightened person experiences these three. So, Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. Jiva Brahmaiva Napara. What does that mean? The absolute alone is real. The appearances are false. And this individual being who is doing all this Vedanta is none other than the Absolute. This will be the realization of the enlightened person. This is the difference. So and is this one connected to this causally? No. What, what goes away is the reality of these things. The reality is absorbed back into the self. The self alone is real. These are projections of the self. I'll come to you. There's a question that yes. Yeah. Um, I attended um, a talk by a Sufi Muslim. Yeah. And um, he mentioned that there is a distinction between a dream and a vision. Yeah. And that a vision, I guess, uh, was inspired by God. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you have any if there's such a distinction. Um, sure. Sure. True. Now, what the Sufi said is correct. But remember, what he is talking about is a distinction in the levels of the discourse that's going on. Here we are talking about something beyond what, uh, what the... Uh, to sit down, yeah. Here we are talking about something beyond what they're talking about. They are talking at the level of conventional religion. Let's forget this for the time being. Let's forget the non-duality for the time being. What he's talking about is, at the level of religion, you have experiences like dreams, where you see things which nobody else sees. But mystics have experiences, like they have visions of God, they hear the voice of God, which again nobody else sees. Now, are they like dreams? Are they errors? Are they illusions? Are they hallucinations? No. Yeah. So that was, that was what the Sufi said. And what would Vedanta say about it? Correct, it's, there, it's not. There are distinct... There is a distinct difference between genuine spiritual experiences, though they may be private. It's only limited to you, to the, to the mystic, and not to anybody else. Uh, but that's still not a hallucination, not a dream. Not an error like a snake seen in a rope. The genuine mystic experience is possible only for the mystic, which are true. 
because they are coming from from God uh, himself or herself or itself so they may be they may actually they're talking about something that's that's really that's real that's uh, spiritually true so this in vedanta also there's a distinction between a dream and a spiritual experience okay Everything is experienced by consciousness here. Ah, our understanding. That's why I'm saying the two levels are different. What she is talking about, what the Sufi said, that also different schools of Hinduism. In fact, every mystical religion will say that there is a difference between mystical experience and dreaming. But what here we are talking about is entirely another level altogether. If you saw it, whether it is a mystical experience or a dream, it is an object to your consciousness. Right? And here we are not interested in the object. I will drive this point home again and again and I will not tire of driving it home. Because it's a very simple point, but it takes time to understand. You see, all experiences we have come in, in this category. In one place, in fact, in the Brahma Sutra, Shankaracharya considers this. The question is raised. Why only dreaming, waking and deep sleep? Why not samadhi? Why not certain mystical... You know, there are trance states. Or there are medically other... You know, there's a coma. He talks about that, a coma. So why not those states? And Shankaracharya says, look, the point is those states, whether an elevated mystical experience, I'm not saying it's not there, it's there, or a medical condition due to some kind of damage, like a coma, all of them, those other states, like a, a mystical experience of the coma, are not something that is shared by everybody. Those are Rare occur occurrences. Some people have them sometimes. Are you with me so far? That's why we are not bringing it into this discussion. We are not bringing it into discussion. Uh, and this discussion doesn't suffer from not bringing those things in. Because our point is, not ordinary experience or mystical experience or subordinary experience. Our point is the experiencer, the very structure of experience. Yes. It's a good question. So, in a mystical experience, can we experience this consciousness? Answer is yes and no. If you experience your consciousness, it must be dressed up in some name or form, in some kind of concept. Because directly, this is, this, is, this is not an object of experience. It is always the experiencer. From Advaita Vedanta point of view, what you are talking about and what all conventional religion, Hinduism, Islam, Christianity are talking about, is the causal affecting the gross and the subtle. Ishwara giving experiences to the waking and the dreaming worlds. We are talking about something beyond God. We are not talking about the contents of experience. The question was about the content of experience. The content of an illusory experience, like a dream, and the content of a mystical experience. Is, are they, are they, is one real and other one false? Yes. Remember the three levels of reality we spoke about in Advaita Vedanta? The, the absolute, the transactional and the illusory. Now a dream belongs to which level of reality? Illusory. illusory. And a mystical uh, experience? Illusory. No, not illusory. Absolute. Not absolute. Transactional. transactional, relative reality. Our world, it has something to say about our world. Even God. God belongs to uh, which level of reality? Absolute or uh, relative? Relative. Relative. relative? relative. It's God dressed up in Maya, then it comes into the level of... Re so in this relative world, there are three realities. In this relative world, you the individual, your world and your God. The skeptic says, you know, here's the very beautiful way of distinguishing. The skeptic says, I and my world are experienced. I know them. They are real. 
this God you are talking about is a hallucination. So what the skeptic is trying to do is to push God down to the level of illusory reality. And what religion insists, the Sufi mystic would say, I would say, a Christian mystic would say, no, that um, experience of God, experience, uh, mystical experiences, they are as real as this table and chair. So, what Advaita Vedanta wants to say, yes, they are as real as this table and chair. There is a greater reality beyond the table and chair, which is, uh, which is the absolute. At the absolute level, only, only this. This itself appears as individual God and world. Yes. That's the concept, right? The burning bush and yeah. Yeah. It was a you know, No, Mo Moses there was you mean an object, there was a subject and an object. Yes. In that case. The, yes. The object was Ishvara, not consciousness. All right. Thing. Just a minute. Let's uh, watch this carefully. You said Moses. Yeah. Desert. Mm -hmm. The desert is part of what? Which level of reality? Illusory? Just go to Arizona. I mean, you'll see. <laughs> the desert which Moses walked into was part of the waking world. Yeah, it's part of the transactional reality. It's part of the vavaharika reality. So Moses himself is part of the vavaharika reality, and so what he experienced there is also part of the vavaharika reality. What a, what a skeptic, a disbeliever, an unbeliever would try to say is that Moses is part of, the, uh, of that reality, the desert is part of the reality, but what he saw was an illusion. So it's, but what religion tells us is, no, it's not an illusion. It's as real as Moses and the desert. It's part of that reality. So, that is, so God at the level of religion is, is part of the, what we call the causal um, state. And it appears in our transactional reality, Vavaharika. But both the transactional reality and the illusory level, they are all manifestations of some, the absolute. The absolute is beyond all of that. In the absolute, no God, no desert, no Moses. At the level of the absolute, you can, you can say Moses, God, the desert and you are one and the same thing. So, in fact, most of the questions of religion are at this level. Yes. So, I'm just picking up on what you just said. You have seven constructs over here. You have the four aspects and three of the aspects have, have the self and the world. So, we've got seven constructs here. Yeah. Out of which four are easy for us to relate to. Four means? We know the world, we know we go to sleep, yeah. we know we are awake, we know we dream, and we are being stupid. Those four, I think we can all relate. No, no, no. Just a minute. Just a minute. Just enumerate. You are. You know yourself is a waker in the waking world. Do you know that yourself is a waking state? Do you know the world that you see is a waking state? Yes. That's one, one aspect. One aspect. Okay. So, you know that you have dreams. Uh -huh. You don't know what this world of dreams is. So, that's one of my questions. Hmm. Now, what is this world of dreams that we're talking about? Because we can relate to the dreams we have. Hmm. But to say that there is a world of dreams is, is, is hard to comprehend. Hmm. And then we have deep sleep. And we hmm. Okay, let's take it uh, again. The, what is the world of dreams? World of dreams is nothing but what you experience in dreams. And what did we see there? What, whatever we have experienced in the waking state, the materials are taken, gathered there, stored in our minds, and those are cooked up as dreams. I mean, they, modern psychiatrist or psychologist would have no problem with this interpretation of the world of dreams. The world of dreams is you as a knowing subject experience many things in your dreams. So you are there in your dreams and you experience many things. There are people, there are things, uh, there are uh, events happening. That's the world of dreams. The, the things which you experience in your dream. In a dream, you don't think it's a dream. In a dream, you think you are there and this is the world I'm experiencing. Right now, like I'm here and this is the world I'm experiencing. Our dreams are exactly like that. It's only because we have woken up from them, then we can dismiss them as a dream. And then we have a collective world of dreams. We are all dreaming. So I have 
Ah, uh, right, right. If you put it all together, that's the totality. All right. So far, we have got that. Okay. Now we, we have got this. That this is I go into after falling asleep. I I I experience a world, waking up from which I call it a dream. Waking up which from which I call it a dream. But I remember I was in the dream and I seem to experience the dream world like a waking world. Okay. Then what happens in deep sleep? This is a try to appreciate their point of view, the way they are trying to understand deep sleep. They go just by experience. So in a deep sleep, and all of this we are analyzing from our waking world. In the deep sleep, what happened? First of all, all the differences that we are seeing in this waking world, and all the differences that we saw, different people, things, events, we saw in the dream world, they seem to have disappeared. They seem to have disappeared. In dream, they, no, we don't see any of that in the, dream, in the deep sleep. So the, all the differences seem to have disappeared. And yet they must admit all these differences come back again. Put these two facts together. Wait. Put these two facts together. All in deep sleep, all the differences, all the people and things you saw in the waking world, all the people and things you saw in the dream world, they seem to have disappeared in deep sleep. Are you with me on that? And yet they come back again when we wake up and when we dream again. In the, you put these two facts together, they disappear and yet they come back, which means they are not gone. They are not perceived. They are there, but in an unperceived mass of you know, blankness. It's like the lights being thrown and all the objects are there. So they say it is all there in a seed form. All our objects, people and things are there in the seed form in the deep sleep state. And I myself, I don't see myself as a knower, as somebody experiencing something in a deep sleep state. I go into um, a place where, then I, where I have no distinct knowledge. In a waking world, you have distinct knowledge. I talked about that. You see so many people, so many things. In dream, you have distinct knowledge. But in deep, deep sleep, no distinct knowledge. So all the different knowledge we have in the waking and dream, they all seem to be merged into a kind of blankness. And all the objects, different objects we see in the waking and the dream, they seem to be merged into a oneness. So this merged state, different words are used, merged state, resolved state, potential state, this is the deep sleep. This is how they understand deep sleep. Is this all right? At the world level, that's still hard. Okay. Now, at my level, this is so. Yeah. Now, this cosmic thing, what happens to it in that case? At the world level, see, the world level itself is a, is, is a tricky thing. The world level, what do you mean by the world level? Right now, what I see is, I am an individual knower with my own equipment, body and mind, and here is a whole world. But what Advaita is saying is that, this individual knower is none other than consciousness with a particular body and mind. But this consciousness is also behind the universe which you are experiencing. So there is a consciousness associated with the totality of the universe. You will say that at this point you should catch and say that's not something we experience. Here is the question of faith here. There is one little introduction here which is not part of our day-to-day -day experience. Even in the waking state. Even the even in the waking state, the fourth mean, you mean this one? Yeah. Alright, that's the whole point. But, but um, let's come to the, even the waking state. I have said something which should, you, you should raise a, uh, an objection there. In the waking state, look at how I describe the waking state. There is an individual waker, you, and the world. And what I'm saying is consciousness appears as the individual waker, with a physical body and consciousness appears as the waking at the world of the individual waker um, uh, with this entire you know the, the world made of five elements or what, whatever consciousness associated with that body and mind is called Vishwa consciousness associated with the entire physical universe is called Virat so the Vishwa the individual being with this body and mind is it understandable because I am that? It's just the name that they are giving me. I am this guy in the waking state, so my name is Vishwa. 
the world they are talking about, that's also understandable because I experience it. But the Virat they are talking about, consciousness associated with the entire universe, that's an item of faith. Do you see, see that there? Because this is not something we have experienced. You know what is this Virat? This Virat is the Vishwarupa which Arjuna experienced in the 11th chapter of the Gita. One consciousness pervading the entire universe, all appearing together. So that thing is there all throughout. Consciousness associated with the entire physical world, Virat. Consciousness associated with all our minds, Hiranyagarbha. And consciousness associated with all our sleeping minds together, which is Ishwara, which is the concept of God. I'll come to you. Now the question would be, this consciousness, which is associated with the individual and the cosmic here, individual and cosmic here, individual and cosmic here, that consciousness in itself, what is it? Without the waking, dreaming, deep sleep, without the causal, subtle, gross. What is the thing itself? The nice example is that uh, there is a man who is a trader. In the, in the way, uh, he, what he does is, in the morning he opens the shut shutters of his shop and trades with the world outside. Lends I and mean, gives things and buys things from them. So things come and go. Then he sh pulls down the shutters, goes into his room and switches on the TV and watches the TV program. Then he switches off the TV and then he goes into his bedroom and goes to sleep. So there is a trader, there is a TV watcher and there is a sleeper. But the man himself is in itself, is a human being, is neither a trader nor a TV watcher nor a sleeper. These are just the activities of that person. The person in himself is the fourth aspect. The trader is the first aspect who deals with the world through the doors of the senses. The dreamer is the second aspect who sits and watches the TV program. And when he puts on his pajamas and goes to sleep, is the third aspect. But the man himself is this one, the fourth aspect. So what is that consciousness? That consciousness should be available to us here, here and here. Yes. So you said that sleep is an experience of non-duality. Deep sleep. Deep uh -huh. sleep. It is an experience of absence. Absence. Non-duality, because non-duality in what sense? Subject and object are merged. Mm -hmm. But it is a period of ignorance yes. as far as we are concerned. Correct. Because we wake from it and acknowledge its presence. Yes. So how does one transition from that undifferentiated all subject experience or the lack of subject object difference from being absent to being present? I, and come again, this question. Okay. So how does one transition from that undifferentiated state where one is absent in the deep sleep hmm. to becoming aware and awake, which is what experiencing the oh. fourth state is. How, how no, no, no. no. During sleep, we don't recognize sleep. I'm not getting the question. R repeat yeah, that again. Let me try. So in deep sleep, uh -huh. you said it's um, non-dual because subject and object are merged. Merged, yes. We yeah. recognize it only after the fact hmm. that we had a deep sleep. Hmm. Consciousness is the pure consciousness, is also a pure awareness, pure subject. Yeah. Subject objects are erased. Hmm. There is no subject object difference. Hmm. But we are not absent at that. How does one recognize that? How does one move from a period of so called sleep and absence to being aware and awake? Aware and awake here, in the, as a waker or the dreamer? Fourth, fourth, fourth. Oh, to the fourth. Yeah. So when you're saying aware and awake, how does one move from the... Oh, all right. Are you saying how does one move from this to awaken, to becoming enlightened? Yeah. One doesn't. One doesn't. One moves, to, one moves to being enlightened from here, waker. That's why you have to come to the Vedanta class in the waking state. <laughs> you cannot be enlightened in deep sleep. <laughs> no, even in, the, in our mythology, you will have people who have spiritual experiences in dream and mostly people who, who become enlightened in the waking state. Not one example of a person becoming enlightened in deep sleep state. 
No, you cannot. What, but what I'm saying is, what is the difference between enlightenment and this one? Here, it's deep sleep, subject and object and merge, and the whole thing is covered in a shroud of ignorance. I gave you one example. Imagine the movie. The movie is switched off, and the lights in the hall have not come on yet. So what that stage is, you don't see a movie, but you don't see the hall also. It's merged in, the whole thing is merged in darkness. Then the lights in the hall come on. I don't know if in nowadays in movies they have inter, intermission or intervals. When we were kids, there used to be a break in between a movie. So the movie would be switched off. It would be dark in the hall for a split second. And then the lights in the hall would come up. Now, in between, that darkness is like deep sleep. Right? And the lights coming on is like this. In the movie, it can happen. But in enlightenment, in, in, in Vedanta, you have to move from the waker to this. Remember, the lights are always on. This one is available right now. To awaken to this, all that is necessary is to notice it. Is to distinguish it. You know, this waker and the waking world, pervading all of this is this one. The diagram might be mis misleading. Right now, here it's there all the time. Just as the screen pervades the entire movie, the movie which is playing, when you play a movie on a screen, whatever is happening on the movie, it's happening on the screen, right? So in a movie, if there is the hero and a car and the car chase and, and a city and, and police cars, the police cars and the hero and the car and the chase and the villain, all of them, every bit of what you see is the screen actually. And yet the screen is not part of the movie. Nowhere in the movie do you suddenly see a screen. When a car chase is going on in a, in a uh, cops and robbers movie, you just suddenly don't see a screen somewhere. But the screen is the reality on which the entire movie is playing. This consciousness is the reality on which this entire movie is playing. This entire movie is playing. And this is where the lights have been switched off. But the screen is the same in all three. It's only in this one that we have to note it. Y you, I'll come to you. You had a question? Uh -huh. We haven't started today's class, by the way. <laughs> yes. In the waker state, I always know who I am. Yes. So, the first time when I take birth, or when my body gets uh, the consciousness um, is illuminated into a body. Yes. Do I remember that I'm Satchitananda Atma? First time when I took the Which birth. is the first time? <laughs> that we don't know. <laughs> We don't know. There is no beginning. According to Vedanta, anadi, beginningless. There is no first time. In fact, there is no time at all. According to Advaita Vedanta, you, you never took a body. You are the Satchidananda. But if I never forget, like suppose I am Arti Hardika, hmm. I know I am Arti Hardika. Yes. Then why would I forget that I am pure consciousness? That's the thing. Why do we sometimes make mistakes? We see a rope as a snake. Why? What is the why of error? The only why is ignorance. That's what's generating or powering our world. There's a nice saying. The falsity, a lie, is not dangerous in itself. It's, it's harmless. It's the, it's the falsity, it's the lie which is laced with truth, which is deadly. If you mix it with truth, Truth and falsity mixed together become stable. And it, it is the basis of our, our, of our lives. Right now what we are experiencing is not just a dream. There is the waking, there is the ultimate reality right here. Based on that there is a dream. The truth and the falsity are mixed up here. We just have to distinguish between them. What you are asking and you are also, you are also asking about how, how we wake up to that. That's what's going to happen in the seventh mantra. We haven't <laughs> gone to that. We are, we are on the sixth mantra yet. We are here. Deep sleep. One question and then we, we go on. Yes. Me? Yes. So on the mat, just going off, taking off and the points that you've made, that there is a, the macro part of it is a harder, and what you said as well, is a harder concept to grasp because it's not a personal experience. Hmm. So is that like saying like Maya is a concept of fate? Not exactly. F Is the dream state, is the, is 
Yes. And I mean, I personally struggle also with the concept of Maya and, you know, like you were saying last week, why do people suffer? And well, I don't know if you were, you were, maybe it was in a talk, but why you were explaining why people, some people suffer in some countries and some people don't, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So is, is Maya a concept of belief or is it real? Um, not just Maya itself, this concept of Ishwara. You're again asking about God, basically. See, what is not a matter of faith here? What is a matter of experience here? That you are an individual is a matter of your own experience. That you experience a world, a totality, which is composed of many other individuals and non-living things. That's also real. What is a matter of faith here is that consciousness associated with an individual being, that's also not a matter of faith because you know you are conscious. But consciousness associated with this entirety, that's a matter of faith. And isn't that Maya? Um, it is mediated through Maya. Consciousness plus Maya is Ishwara. Yes. So that is a matter of faith. And matter of experience to some people, those who have experience of God. But the interesting thing is, we are not even interested in the totality. We are not interested in the individual, we are not interested in the total. We are interested in that which appears as the individual in the total. And that one is constantly available to us, not a matter of faith. So it has, it has, it, that's what they are trying to do, they are trying to point it out to us. These are questions of religion. Advaita Vedanta in Manduke, what they are trying to point out is something going beyond religion. It does not require much faith. That's why we needed yeah. to be able to rationalize what we see around us. Otherwise, we would be just, it's not just us, there is a whole world around us. Yes. So we need to rationalize how does this world exist. Yeah. And that's why the world view is important too, right? It's not just an individual view. Correct. Even though we are the one viewing it. Correct. Now, in our case, see, this gives you a world view. What is the world that you experience? It is saying that you and the world that you experience are one reality. That's the worldview that Mandukya Upanishad is giving. This is the one reality. Because we do not experience this, we do not understand this one, we understand ourselves as this one only, then we find ourselves as one individual in a vast world of many, many individuals. But if you understood yourself as this one, then you would see you appear as this individual and also the entire vast world. So that's the worldview of uh, Mandukya. It's very easy to understand this if you take the example of our dreams. Your individual dream. You yourself dream up a universe in your mind where the totality is nothing other than your mind in that universe. And in that universe you are present as an individual. You see, what happens in our dreams? In your dream, you are yourself there in your dream. You are there, right? Not many people are seen to be there in their dreams. <laughs> You are there in your dream and you see a world in your dream. When you wake up from the dream, you realize that you who were there in the dream and the world that you experienced in the dream, the totality, all of that was dreamt up by your mind. In the same way, here is a potential for misunderstanding. I'm not saying that the waker is dreaming of the waking world. I'm saying consciousness, just as the dreamer's mind appears as the individual in the dream and the dreamer's world, Consciousness is appearing as the waker and the waker's world. That's what the, what the claim is here. <laughs> we still have not started today's class. <laughs> yes. You've used the word Ishwara in two places. Hmm. One is uh, the dreamer's world. Hmm. Uh, the, sorry. Deep the sleep. World. And also uh, the combination of consciousness and Maya. Hmm. what appears to you in the waking world or what appears to you in the dream world and they are only impressions or experiences. So can you just explain what do you mean by Maya when you're saying consciousness plus Maya? Remember, I just introduced this in the background of our Vedantic studies earlier because this book does not um, introduce the term Maya. Right. What is Maya here is in your own individual experience, 
you experience a waking world. Okay? One. Now I need some feedback there. Yes? And in your own individual experience, you experience a dream world. Right? In your own individual experience, you experience a deep sleep world. What is that deep sleep world? It is a pot they are describing it as the potential state of your dream and waking world. Now that's in an individual uh, capacity. Imagine the entirety of this universe, all individuals put together. So consciousness with all individuals put together experiences a waking world, a gross, waking world would be the gross world. That is called Virat. Consciousness experiences a subtle world that would be called Hiranyagarbha. Consciousness experiences a causal world where all the variety of differences of the waking and dream worlds are merged together, lumped together into a, um, a potential state. That potential state is Maya. Consciousness is this. And with that Maya, this consciousness with Maya is called Ishwar. This is a standard terminology in Advaita Vedanta. The consciousness associated with Maya is Ishwara. Maya is that potential state of the entire cosmos. Okay, now let's go ahead and start today's class. <laughs> Gaudapada, he wants to give us a break at this point. So, you know, in the original, in the Upanishad, the third mantra was about the waking state, the fourth mantra was about the dream state, and the fifth and sixth mantras were about the deep sleep state. Now, Gaudapada is going to talk about, the Upanishad is going to talk about the fourth state. What you are all asking about. You are all impatient to get to the fourth state, the reality. That is going to come in the seventh mantra. But before we get to the seventh mantra, Gaudapada declares time out. He is going to consolidate what we have learned so far. So he is going to write some verses. Remember the text, the text is structured in this way. The Upanishad is called the Mandukya Upanishad. And it is embedded in a text called Mandukya Karika, written by Gaudapada. So the Mandukya Karika has four chapters. In the first chapter, you find the Mandukya Upanishad plus some Karikas written by Gaudapada. What are Karikas? They are verses commenting on the Upanishad. So right now, after, con after going through six mantras of the Upanishad, Gaudapada says, stop. Before you go to the seventh mantra, I'm going to compose some verses. About what? About whatever we have learned so far. And he helps us. He puts all this learning together and in, in gives us a bird's eye view of, of what? Waking, dreaming and deep sleep. And look how he puts it. Many of the terms which we used here, Vishwa, Virat, Taijasa, Hiranyagar, Bapragya, these are actually, many of them are not in the Upanishad itself. They have been introduced by Gaudapada to help us to understand these concepts. So now I think he will give us how many? Nine karikas or? 1.9. Yeah, nine karikas. Nine verses before he, we go on to the seventh mantra. The fourth aspect of consciousness, the reality and enlightenment. Before you get enlightened, you have to listen to some poetry. He's that guy who stops you and says, would you like to listen to something I composed? <laughs> What's going to happen in these nine mantras? In the, in the, in the, in the nine karikas? Um... What's going to happen? In the first five karikas, did you find it? Here, page 185. Just after the sixth mantra. Yes. The first five karikas are a summation of what we learned here. And the way he summarizes, he has his unique creative way of summarizing. Um, he is going to uh, talk about the three aspects, the three um, locations, the three experiences, and the three satisfactions. So what does that, that mean? We will see. And then in the next few mantras, uh, next few karikas, 6th, 7th, 8th, and ninth karikas, he is going to answer, he is going to consider a question which may come up th this way. If this is all true, then why does that one pure consciousness do this? Why does it appear in all these forms? Why does the one become the many? The grandest of all questions. 
It's the same question that modern uh, astrophysics is trying to answer. In a, only thing is, from an Advaitic perspective, astrophysics is a very limited thing because it's limited to the waking world. <laughs> You're trying to answer it in the physical world. But anyway, why does, according to Mandukya Upanishad, the Turiya, the fourth, fourth aspect, this pure consciousness, alone appears as waker and waking world, dreamer and dream world, deep sleeper and deep sleep world. Why? So, that will be talked about. Today we will see the first few verses. Verse 1, Karika 1. So now it's not the Upanishad anymore, it's Gaudapada speaking. Karika 1. Have you got it? Please chant after me. Bahish Pragyo Vibhur Vishwo Bahish Pragyo Vibhur Vishwo Yanta Pragyas to Taija Saha Yanta Pragyas to Taija Saha Gana Pragyas Tatha Pragya Gana Pragyas Tatha Pragya Eka Eva Tridhas Mitaha Eka Eva Tridhas Mitaha Listen, it's all a bird's eye view. What she's going, he's just helping us to consolidate whatever we have learned. So what does he say? The three, uh, the three, first of all, the padatrayam, three aspects. In Sanskrit, padatrayam, three aspects. He is going to talk about waking, dreaming and deep sleep here. What does he say here? The Vishwa experiences external things and is all pervading. But Taijasa experiences the internal things. Similarly, Pragya is a mass of consciousness. It is but the same entity that is thought of in three ways. So look, he set it all out for us. The Vishwa experiences the external things means the external world. Okay? But there are two aspects to it. The Vishwa and the Virat. So that he has mentioned two. Uh, Vishwa is the one which experiences the external world. And the consciousness which is Virat pervades that external world also. He has mentioned the individual aspect and the cosmic aspect here also. So, uh, Vishwa and Vibhu. The word Vishwa for the first time has been used here. Vibhu means all-pervading. How is, you will say, I am not all-pervading. I experience external things, but I am not all-pervading. You are not all-pervading because you are the waker here. But this consciousness as the Virat is all-pervading. Virat means the consciousness associated with everything. That's the first quarter of this verse. Second quarter is Anta Pragyas to Taijasa. The dreamer has his awareness turned inwards into the mind and, and experiences objects dreamt of by the mind. So the dreamer is inward turned, Anta Pragya. Anta means into the mind. One question you may ask here is the dreamer, the Taijasa individual there, does not actually think about it that way. That person also thinks like I'm experiencing an external world. Right? But because we are doing all this analysis from the waking state, what does it look like from our state? That's the way it has been presented. From our state, it seems we are experiencing an external world. When I dream, I'm just dreaming in my mind. And when I'm in deep sleep, everything is resolved into a blankness. That's how I look at it. And that's how it's being presented. Anta Pragya Taijasa. So the word Taijasa has been used here. Taijasa is the one, the dreamer, whose awareness is turned inwards into the mind. Ghana Pragya Statha Pragya. The word Pragya has been used here, the deep sleeper. What is the condition of the deep sleeper? All knowledge is fused into a mass of indistinctness. In the Upanishad, the word used was Pragyana Ghana, a mass of awareness. Here he has reversed it. He says Ghana Pragya for, for uh, uh, poetic and rhyming. Bahish Pragya, externalized consciousness. Anta Pragya, awareness internalized. Into, internalized into what? Into the mind. Ghana Pragya, a mass of indistinct awareness. One is the waker, one is the dreamer, one is the deep sleeper. So, Eka Eva Tridhasmitaha. It is one reality which is appearing in these three aspects. So the three aspects have been mentioned in this verse. Now let's go to the next verse. Which will give us something which is not mentioned in the Upanishads at all. So he will give us something new there in the second verse. 
the three places. What do you mean places? Dakshinakshi Mukhe Vishwa Dakshinakshi Mukhe Vishwa Manasyanta Stutai Jasaha Manasyanta Stutai Jasaha Akashe Charhidi Pragya Akashe Charhidi Pragya Tridha Dehe Vyabasthitaha Tridha Dehe Vyabasthitaha this takes some explanation. What he's saying is, literally let me translate it first. The waker, Vishwa, is present in the right eye. The Taijasa, the dreamer, is present in the mind. And the Pragya, the deep sleeper, is present in the space within your heart. In three ways, all of them are present in this particular body. Where? Here, in the mind, and in the space within your heart. What does that mean? Okay, here's something to me. <laughs> these are thought experiments, like your brain in the vat. These are, these are called meditations, upasanas. Before we go on to enlightenment, full-blown realization, what the Upanishad does is, it, it wants us to sit down quietly and and, and consider the concepts of waker, dreamer and deep sleep. So for that it gives us an exercise. You the waker who experiences the waking world, that being, think of that being, meditate on that being. Meditate on yourself as the waker. To meditate you need a place to meditate. Remember the guru tells you, think of your deity, uh, uh, Krishna in your heart. There's a lotus here and think of the Lord in your heart and meditate in your heart. That's because to concentrate the mind needs a place to concentrate on. So think of the waker, you the waker. Where, where should I think of the waker? Think of the waker as in the right eye. Here, I am the waker, I am here. And contemplate that. What is the waker? What are the experiences of the waker? What does it feel like to be a waker? Contemplate it here. Why here? Did Gaudapada just cook this up by himself? Because the Upanishad doesn't say anything like that. These are present in other Upanishads. These are exercises. It doesn't mean really there is some guy called the waker here in your right eyeball. It's not that. It's an imagination. It's a thought experiment. It's called a meditation in the, in the Upanishads. There are many of such thought experiments. These are exercises given to us. They expand our understanding and prepare us for enlightenment. So think of it, so why the eye, uh, right eye, why not the left eye or why not the tip of the nose or something like that? Well, we can think of different uh, answers. You as the waking person, there's this uh, psychologist here, Greg Good, he gave a number of exercises, very interesting. Locate yourself, you are the waker, where do you find yourself? Locate yourself, you see here, do you uniformly pre feel present in this body? Do you feel you are as present in the head as in the toenail? No. I don't feel uniformly present in this body. I pre I'm present in this body. Then Greg Good says, draw a line through your waist. Where would you say you are in this body? The bottom, below the line or above the line? Above. Most people would say, I am above the line. If you force me to choose, where are you? That individual being right now, where are you in this body? You feel you are here. So where here? Then we feel a little uncomfortable with that question. But where? Draw a line here. We'll feel, okay, above this. Okay, above this. Draw a line through the middle of your chest, parallel to the ground. Where? In the belly or above uh, the, that line? Above. Almost everybody, I think. With a few rare, interesting uh, individuals. But <laughs> otherwise, everybody would say, I'm above. I'm, I am above this line in the, through the middle of my chest. Okay, you are above. Draw a line through the middle of your throat. <laughs> Draw a line through that. Now, do you feel you are here? Often when we say I, we say here. But where do you feel actually? Where do you actually locate yourself? Do you feel here, uh, here or here? Above. Above. Greg Good says most. Again, many people would say above. Okay, very good. Above means here. All right. Now, he says, um, this head, you draw two lines. 
one this way and one this way. Okay? Now, where do you feel? You're here above, you're here somewhere. Where? Are you on this side or this side or this side? In here, somewhere in here. Middle. Many people will say middle, some will say like this, this way or that way. Basically, the physiological reason is very simple. A lot of nerve endings are here. Uh, your face is full of these nerve endings. And one reason, the doctor says, because of the eyes, a great deal of your cognitive capacity is taken up by eyes. There's, there's a real reason why meditation teachers tell you to close your eyes when you meditate. It frees up a lot of your cognitive capacity if you close your eyes. If you open your eyes and looking around, a lot of brain power is taken up in that processing. A sense of presence is there in the eyes here. So it seems to make some sense that you would think of yourself as being in the eyes or somewhere around the eyes. Why the right eye? It's just a toss of the coin. <laughs> you can take up anything. Think of yourself as in the eye. Contemplate the waker. You the waker here. What are you exactly? Then contemplate the dreamer. This one is easy to understand. Where is the dreamer? In the mind. Good. Because we understand dreams are in the mind. So dreamer is in the mind. Then contemplate the deep sleeper. Upanishad say in deep sleep our awareness is withdrawn to a place somewhere here. Uh, this is some nerve plexus here. So awareness is withdrawn from all of the over the body to here. That's why they say, uh, this, give this example. Consider a space within your chest. Imagine all your awareness withdrawn there in, in, an, un, in a resolved condition, potential condition. <coughs> That's the deep sleeper. So meditate upon the deep sleeper here. So this is an exercise given in preparation for the upcoming enlightenment in the seventh mantra. Should we quickly do the next two and finish? Three and four. Three and four. And they are quick because I can see Shankaracharya. So the text is, there is the Upanishad. Commenting on that is the Karika of Godapada. And commenting on that is the um, commentary of Shankaracharya. So I can see in these t next two mantra, uh, the next two verses... Shankaracharya said then it requires no explanation. He has given no, no commentary. So we can quickly do it. What are the next two verses about? Let's see. Three. Vishwa hi sthula bhuk nityam Vishwa hi sthula bhuk nityam Taija sapra vivikta bhuk Taija sapra vivikta bhuk Ananda bhuk tatha pragya Ananda bhukta tha pragya Tridha bhogam nibodhata Tridha bhogam nibodhata What are the experiences of the three? The, the waker experiences gross objects. Gross means not awful objects. They can be very fine objects also. But gross means the sense of physical. So what does the waker experience? Rupa, rasa, gandha, sparsha, shabda. Forms and tastes and smells and... And, uh, and what else? Sounds and touch. So they, these are uh, sthula bhuk, gross objects of experience. The waker experiences these. These are its experience. So this is bhoga. Bhoga literally means the f sacred food offering which you give to the Lord. <coughs> so what food offering do you give to the Lord who is within you, the waker, you? The food offering given to you are rupa rasagandha sparsha. They are the, the forms and, the, and the sounds and smells and touch and taste. That is the bhoga offered to you. What is the experience of the dreamer? He says, the experience of the dreamer is Taijasa Pravivikta Bhuk. It experiences thought, subtle objects. The dreamer, you will say the dreamer, as a dreamer I also experience form and uh, sound. Don't I hear things in the dream? Don't I see things in the dream? True. But all those forms and sounds and tastes and touch and smell you experience in the dream, they are made of what? Thought. From your waking point of view. When you look back, what happened? What did I see actually? I saw people, I ate food, but clearly I was dreaming. So all of that was made by thought. So the dreamer experiences thought. Deep sleeper, Ananda Bhuk, experiences bliss, the bliss of rest. The deep sleeper experiences Restfulness, peacefulness, that is Ananda, bliss. 
Or you can say the deep sleeper experience is ignorance. So ignorance is bliss. So <laughs> Ananda Bhog. <laughs> so the Bhoga, the food offering for these three great deities. Who are these three deities? You. Those three deities. For the, for the waker, it is the gross names and uh, gross forms and sounds and tastes. This is, this is the Bhoga being offered to you continuously. For the dreamer, it is the thoughts. thoughts. And for the deep sleeper, it is the restfulness or peacefulness of deep sleep. That's all. Then number four. What are the... Um, what pleases these three guys? The waker, dreamer and deep sleeper. What pleases you as a waker? What pleases you as a dreamer? What pleases you as a deep sleeper? Stulam tarpayate vishwam Stulam tarpayate vishwam Praviviktam tu taijasam Praviviktam tu taijasam Anandascha tatha pragyam Anandascha tatha pragyam Tridha triptim nibodhata Tridha triptim nibodhata Tarpana no. For Hindus, it has a specific meaning. It's the food offerings you give to your departed ancestors. But literally, the Sanskrit word tarpana means to please. What will please you? It'll give you, give me a cup of cook, uh, uh, coffee and cookies that pleases me. So that's your tarpana. That's the offering which pleases you. What pleases the waker? The physical pleases the waker. It's basically another way of saying the same thing. The physical universe pleases the waker. Sthulam tarpayate vishwam. Vishwa is pleased by physical uh, entities. Then praviviktam tu taijasam. The subtle. Praviviktam literally means other than the gross. It basically means the subtle. Praviviktam separated, other than. The subtle pleases the dreamer. And deep sleeper. Anand, the bliss, pleases the deep sleeper or, or restfulness or peacefulness pleases the deep sleeper. Tridha triptim nivodhata. Thus you should understand the three kinds of pleasing. That's it. I think we should read the fifth one also. It neatly ties everything together. Trishu dhamasu yad bhojyam. Trishu dhamasu yad bhojyam bhokta yascha prakirtita bhokta yascha prakirtita vedaita dubhayam yastu vedaita dubhayam yastu sabhunjano na lipyate sabhunjano na lipyate Beautiful verse which ties up everything. In the three in the three States, Trishu Dhamasu, in the three states, Yad Bhodjam, whatever is experienced, gross, subtle, causal. And whoever the experiencer is, waker, dreamer, deep sleeper, both of them in each, each state, the subject and the object in each state, they are illumined, they are, um, they are expressed by one reality. He is pointing to the fourth one, which even while experiencing all this is not affected by it. Bhunjano nalipyate. Even though it is the same consciousness which appears as the subject here and the waking world here and experiences itself, it is not affected by the experiencing. Though the waker is very much affected, tragedy is affected, um, uh, you know, comedy is affect him, the dreamer is very much affected by the dream. And the deep sleeper also enjoys the deep sleep. But the one consciousness which appears as both in each case is not affected by these experiences. It enables all these experiences to happen. It supports all these experiences. But it itself is transcendent. Vivekananda, I'll end with this, in his poem, Song of the Sannyasin, I think. One alone exists. In him is Maya dreaming this dream. The one alone exists, it appears as nature's soul. So one alone exists, in him is Maya dreaming this dream. That one alone appears as soul, that means the object, a uh, subject and the nature. The objective world, here, here, here. 
That one alone is the Atman. We think we are this and the Upanishad is trying to push us to something, a new understanding than this one. That's the whole project. Okay, I'll chant Om three times. Sit relaxed. <coughs> I always present the same thing in different diagrams. You can, now you'll know, whichever way I present it, it's the same thing. This is A, this is U, this is M. Mm. This is the silence. Silence after the M, mm, underlying all of these also. Om 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 When you are ready, you can gently open your eyes. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Arpanamastu